I hope all of you, especially those of you who stay in this field of poverty, will take occasions frequently to actually interact directly with the poor through soup kitchens or through visits to uh, places where they go, like Kathy does, um, or involvement with them in some program or through their churches is another great way. Uh, it's just crucial to be able to keep your keep your hands around the idea that poor people are people just like us. They have the same kind of needs and desires. They are different in many ways, as uh, Fitzgerald famously said. Uh, but still, uh, it's very important to maintain contact with them. Now, having said that, I'm going to talk exclusively from data. I don't have any wonderful anecdotes about my encounters with the poor people and so forth. I'm just going to talk from numbers, and I, I uh, hope you can learn something that way. Here's what I want to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about the trends in poverty and inequality, which may be a little bit different uh, than you read about in the New York Times. Then I'm going to talk about government spending on means-tested programs. Means-tested simply means that there's a level below which you have to have your income in order to qualify for the program. And they vary all over the place. There's no, con no consistency to it. But means-tested, roughly speaking, programs for low-income people, mothers, fathers, children, fathers uh, less than mothers and children. And then the third thing I want to talk about and my main reason, reason uh, for giving this talk, and uh, I've worked on it for some time, is pathways out of poverty and, and inequality. And I think there are things we can do, though it is very difficult. I am definitely not an optimist. I will not leave you uh, with an optimistic uh, vision because I think it's not an appropriate time for optimism. There are rays of hope here, and people like you are going to have to deliver them. Uh, otherwise, we're in for it. So first, trends in poverty and inequality. Here's the uh, record of poverty in the United States uh, since 1959. And as you can see, it's not a great story. We made a lot of progress at first in the, uh, before roughly uh, 1965, uh, and then it kept going especially with the elderly. This is really, I think, one of the two successful stories about poverty in our history, the elderly. Uh, and this is not based on work, this is based on government benefits, but the government benefits in turn are based on work. It is entirely because of Social Security that we have continued to make this progress. Old people retire, they get Social Security. Now, I'll just say as a footnote here that that program is in a certain amount of danger, polls with college students so that many of them think they're never going to get Social Security, which I think is not true, uh, but it does have serious financial problems and that shades much of the rest of poverty policy. I want you to remember that. I'm not going to talk too much about it, uh, but if you ask me about it during question and answer period, I'd love to talk about it, and that is that all of these programs that we know and love are being squeezed because we spend so much money on the elderly. And it's not going to stop. Indeed, it's going to get worse. And as you can tell by the last three years, when Congress was completely, absolutely ridiculous, they gave the lie to anybody who thinks that there's a rational process up there. They did manage to save money in a lot of it. But they didn't attack the heart of the problem, which is Social Security and especially Medicare and other health programs. Fortunately, the rate of growth in those has slowed down a little bit, but you can almost bank on it that it will start again. And it, all we'll do is bring the crisis sooner. We're borrowing too much money, it's got to stop. And right now, immediate effect is it's squeezing other programs. Many of you probably have heard that wonderful word, word sequestration, especially in Virginia because of all the military spending that's getting cut. But it also cut programs for the poor. Head Start, for example, got cut. Housing programs got cut. Child care got cut. And this is going to continue until we solve our budget problems. So this is something to store away and remember. It's a huge problem, and we have our policymakers in Washington to thank for it. Uh, they're doing their best imitation of Detroit. <laughs> so here are the elderly, a very nice story. But look at children. Here are kids, uh, here are kids um, from, these are black kids, and these are, uh, these are all children. And as you can see, we have made virtually no progress, except in the case of black children. And this story right here is the one that Kathy celebrated a few minutes ago. I thought I'd never say that Kathy celebrated, but uh, it's due to welfare reform. I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. But other than this story right here, of, and it essentially amounts to a beautiful bipartisan story of more work by mothers and lots of income supplements, as uh, Kathy described, not just the IPC, but others as well. 
and this nice story about the elderly. Other than that, our poverty policy has been largely unsuccessful and continues to be. Now, pre-tax post-transfer income. I'm showing you this slide mainly because I just want you to have a frame of mind that the country is not going to hell. The president loves to go out and give speeches about the disappearing middle class and huge problems our middle class is having. This is done by the Congressional Budget Office, untouched by Republican hands, okay? You divide the income distribution to five equal parts, called quintiles. Here's the bottom, second, and so forth, all the way up to the top. And then here's up top 1%. So five quintiles. This is their income, the blue ones in 1979, and this is their income in 2007. It in, this is a very comprehensive definition of income, and let me give you a little lesson right here. When you read those articles in the New York Times about how people are poor and they don't have enough income and so on, they almost always leave out the government benefits. I'll show you how big those are in just a minute. The CBO did not do that. CBO includes all the government benefits, including the value of health insurance, the first time they've ever done that. And what we find out is that every single quintile is doing better, 1979 to 2007. So this is a very encouraging story. Now, it masks something, these increases, especially here at the bottom. What it masks is, if I had plotted up here, market income, what people earned, and not government benefits, then the story would not be so good. There are big problems at the bottom. People are having a hard time getting jobs and earning money at the bottom. It's still possible, and millions still do it, but it's more difficult than it, certainly than it was in the 1990s when we passed welfare reform. Uh, and today, it's much more difficult. But the government stepped in, and here's a shocking thing about government. In 2009, we're in the midst of the worst recession we've had since the Great Depression, huge unemployment rates, and do you know that poverty did not increase? It did not increase because of food stamps, and several other means-tested programs exploded, and shockingly, the Congress acted and passed legislation that increased the benefits for low-income families, increased food stamps, in increased the child tax credit, in increased several other programs, and even created some new programs, plus they gave the states more money to operate their cash welfare program, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Family Programs that was created in 1996. Now, the other thing I want to emphasize here is the top. I, uh, it's hard to find words to describe this. Um, maybe I could tell you an anecdote. I'd be like Kathy here. Anecdote. There's a wonderful book by Franks uh, about, uh, it's called Richest Stan. I urge you to read it. You'll get a real kick out of it. He tells a story about a, a dot-com millionaire, billionaire actually, uh, who was in competition to have the biggest and best yacht. And he got the idea that his yacht not just, shouldn't just have a helicopter. A lot of people had yachts with helicopters. He wanted a yacht with a submarine. So he had a company build him a yacht that had a submarine, and he'd bring his friends out and get in the submarine. It sounds kind of dangerous to me, but they did it. Well, that's the kind of thing you can do when, you have, when you're in a nation that has this kind of income distribution. There are lots of experts to describe how this happened. I'm not sure I understand it, uh, but we have the kind of economy where people really, really can get rich. Many of them are, uh, were not born in the United States. They come to the United States, they have a good idea, and the, our economy is such a good ideas. We have lots of people running around looking for folks with good ideas and trying to give them money. If they have a good idea and they can make it work, they can, get, they can raise money uh, to create Amazon.com or a zillion other uh, enterprises that are happening in the United States. So this, this is I don't particularly like this part of the story. I don't know what people do when they make $100 million a year, but that's the way our economy is, and it's getting used to it. But the point is, we have lots of movement. We have movement all up and down, and people, even people at the bottom are doing better, at least until the, uh, until the Great Recession. Now here's another point that I just want to mention in passing, I think it's good for you to know, and that is, Kathy mentioned this uh, slightly, and that is, we pride ourselves on being a nation of opportunity. Home of the free, land of the brave, and they should have added opportunity. And we do have a lot of opportunity. But, other countries 
appear to have more opportunity than the United States. Now, this is a bad thing to say in an audience out in the countryside. People don't necessarily like you to say that. I've had that experience several times. Here's some evidence. There are other evidence, but this is my favorite. This is a correlation between son's income and their father's income. So the closer you are to your father in income, the higher the correlation. And here you can see the United States leads the way. You can get all the way down to Denmark. It's only 25 percent. The United States is 42 percent. Now, that does leave a lot of room for movement. So not every apple falls right underneath the tree. But in the United States, it falls closer to the tree than in any other country. That's something to keep in mind. And I, I think that's something to be concerned about. All right, so poverty and inequality now. Why are they so stubborn? Why have we not made more progress? And here are my answers. Work rates, wages, family composition, education, and then there are a bunch of other factors, some of them quite important, but I just don't have time to talk about everything, so I'm not going to talk about these. I would say immigration. Um, if, if we had better immigration policy, Congress is considering immigration right now, and really I just don't see the downsides of passing an immigration bill. Uh, but they probably aren't going to do it because I don't think they can get anything reasonable through the House. But we could really boost our economy and reduce government expenditures, and I think we could really uh, reduce poverty by maybe a quarter to a half percentage point if we change our immigration policy. We have too many uneducated, low-income immigrants coming into the country. That's because we have such an emphasis on family relationships. And we ought to do what other countries do and emphasize education and skills and try to bring in a higher proportion. That doesn't mean we're not going to bring in relatives. We're still going to continue to do that. But adjust that downwards and adjust upwards the skilled uh, and educated immigrants that will add to our economy and all of America will benefit from it. We could do that. All right, so let's start with work rates. Oh, first I want to tell you about government spending. I just want to get this out of the way. Here is the spending. Uh, the dark line is the spending per person in poverty, and the check line uh, is the 10 biggest programs. So this is really not all of it. But you can see that we increase spending every year and have done so almost forever. There's a slight change uh, during the Reagan years uh, and even before the Reagan years, but we spend a lot of money. And this is just federal dollars. If we add the state dollars to this, we would get up to about a trillion dollars. We spend about a trillion dollars on these means-tested programs. Much of it is on health, but on cash, employment and training, education, and so forth. So you can see that the government has been doing its part. Government does a lot to reduce poverty. And if we could have even better government policy, I think we could do even more. We'll talk about some of that in a few minutes. But I just did not want you to have the feeling that government is backing off. Unfortunately, the sequestration story I told you about, there are some cuts now. But I will bet you that in total, we still, means tested spending will still go up or very, very nearly go up, even with those sequestration cuts. Um, so we're, we have a lot of money to spend on these programs if we can learn how to do it better. Here's how it's spent. It's, you can see it's on health care more than anything else, all the way down to employment, uh, uh, how we spend the money. So it's really widely spread. Now, I want to do one more thing. I'm going to come back to this one in a little more uh, complicated way in a minute, but I want to show you how government programs work. Kathy mentioned this. Uh, this, again, was done by Health and Human Services back, I think it was done in 2006. I used to edit a thing called the Green Book, and I got them to do this analysis. They work with the Congressional Budget Office. Kind of a hard analysis to do. So let's, what, these are, these are uh, unmarried families, and here is their poverty rate if they never got any government benefits. It's about 40 percent. The next, when I show you this later in the presentation, it's going to be even higher than that because it's before welfare reform, but 40 percent. So life in the state of nature, a little less than half the people are poor. And now here come government benefits. These are social insurance programs and the means-tested programs I've been talking about, but not the EITC that Kathy talked about and not the child tax credit. And it does a nice job of reducing the poverty rate down to 29.9%. And now when we add the tax benefits, it goes down further to 26.1%. So we get a reduction in poverty of over a third because of government programs. That's the way they're supposed to work. It's supposed to be a coordinated effort that people work and they don't make enough money to get themselves and their children out of poverty, so government programs supplement their income. I personally worked on a number of pieces of legislation back in the 80s and early 90s 
and there were, I would say, at least 30 or 40 pieces of legislation uh, that, per that indicate a shocking thing. And the shocking thing is Congress had vision. Congress had vision. They wanted to make sure that in the future, that when people left welfare, we didn't hit them over the head with a hammer and take all their benefits away. So we have phase out rates, and even more important, we have other benefits you can only get when you work, like their income tax credit and the child tax credit. And so as those welfare benefits go down, the EITC goes up, and it works out pretty well. Almost every family that leaves welfare and works, if they work anything close to three quarter time or more, they have more money because they work. And that's the way it should work, and that's what Congress wanted to do because they changed all of those programs. I'll show you more about that in a few minutes. All right, so um, this is a slide that shows you ought to warm you up in thinking about what we could do about poverty. This is a simulation. I want to be very careful to point this out for students. Experiments are how we really know things. Random assignment experiments where we have a good control and experimental group. Anything else is suspect in my view. Now, we could have an argument about that, but I didn't say it's wrong. I just said it's suspect. And this is suspect. But still, I think it gives you the picture. And the question raised here, this is based on Census Bureau data, actual data describes the country. And then we just do some simulations and we say, hey, what would happen if everybody worked full time? At the current wage, so we're not, this is not something, uh, you know, that we're thinking people are going to go to Harvard and be in Kathy's class and wind up being a millionaire. We're just, they work full time at whatever wage, or if they don't work at all, whatever wage the average, the people with their education level make. And the answer is that we would reduce the poverty rate 42%. Well, what if we increase marriage rates? Think of this one especially. I'll come back to this. We just matched males on the basis of age, of age, race, and education with females in the Census Bureau, took them and matched them, and said, okay, now they're a household. How much money would they have? And if you do that until you get enough couples married to equal the marriage rate that existed in the United States in 1970. So this is not pie in the sky. We actually had this many marriages at one point. What would happen? And the answer is it would reduce poverty by almost 30% without one single action by government. Individual decisions. So you can tell from that that our individual decisions that Kathy talked a lot about on family composition are having a huge impact on poverty. If we increase education to every kid to have a high school degree, that would reduce it 15%. My favorite is doubling cash welfare, which is not going to happen in our lifetime. Doubling cash welfare is not going to happen in God's lifetime. Uh, but even if we did it, it would only reduce the poverty rate 8%. So that gives you some idea. The main reason I showed you this is individual decisions about work and marriage and education are way more important than public programs. Even though public programs play a role, I'm not against public programs, as you've already seen. All right, so how are we going to turn this situation around and reduce poverty and increase opportunity and decrease inequality? The first thing is education. Now, here's evidence point number one. In all my years in social science, when I first saw this chart, I thought, I have never seen a chart like this before. This is amazing to me. So think of this. Starting with 1963, going all the way to 2011, these are various levels of education. So, so this is no high school degree, high school degree, some college, four-year degree, professional degree. These lines never touch. Never touch. It has always paid in America to get more education. Point number one. Point number two, look what's happened at the end of this line. Look at these. Even if you're a high school graduate and have some college or you're a high school graduate, or your high school dropout. In all those cases, on average, people have been learning, earning less for two or three decades. If you want to make money, on average now, there are obviously, these are social science bill on averages, and they're misleading sometimes, so there are lots of good stories about people who defy the odds. But on average, you have to get a four-year degree. And even then, as you can tell at the end here, it's not necessarily a guarantee. So education is really a key. And if we were smart, we would really be focused like a laser on education. And so would town councils and school boards and local mayors and above all parents would be focused on education. And here's another example of how 
important education is. This is taken from one of the best longitudinal data sets in the world. I always, hesitate, I always get excited when I talk about these data because they're so spectacular. And you know, normal people, like a lot of people out there in this audience, probably think someone who gets excited about numbers is a little weird. Uh, here's what's in this data set. Start at University of Michigan, way back in the 60s. 5,000 families, follow them year after year after year after year and get their income and their job and their household composition, all that. And then as their kids are born, follow the kids. So pretty soon, well, after a while, you have a data set that has the income from the parents and the kids, even when they're like 30 years old, which is entering prime earning years. So just think of the great analysis you can do about the relationship between parents and child's income. And here's what we have here. On this side are all the people in the sample with the kids that did not go to college. And all the college ones are on this side. So let's start here. This is parents in the bottom fifth right here, okay? Next fifth and so forth. Where do their kids wind up? This shows you that 45% of the children whose parents were in the bottom fifth themselves wind up in the bottom fifth. This is apple from the tree kind of thing in a negative way. This is poor people uh, really have a high probability of passing on their poverty to their kids. So if you're in the bottom 20%, most of these people are poor. If your parents were in the bottom 20%, 45% of them wind up in the bottom. And think of this, this is a, you, you, there's never going to be better data to answer this question in this data set right here. So this is really, this gives you an idea of how sticky, to use the economist term, things are at the bottom. It is hard to get out of the bottom. And similar, if we look at the top, 3% of the kids from the bottom make it all the way to the top, 3%. If everything was equal, as the economists like to say, it'd be 20% in each of the five, or close to 20% in each of the five quintiles. Now let's look over the kids that go to college. This is not 45% now, it's 10%. So the kids from the same parents, bottom 20%, and these kids get a four-year degree and only 10% of them wind up in the bottom. And let's look at the top. 10% and not 3%. 10% not 3%. 10% not 45%. So education makes a big difference. We spend about $200 billion on various scholarship, loan, and grant programs for um, probably a majority of it, probably a substantial majority of it, on low-income kids. So low-income kids at Kathy's institution, low-income kids go free, including room and board. And there are a number of great universities like that, and m almost every university has programs that help these kids go to college. So if we could get more kids more education, we would do a lot about inequality. So education is really crucial, another example of why. And yet, look at this. Here are the scores uh, from the uh, National Assessment of uh, Educational Progress. And look at these scores in math and in reading. This is a carpenter's dream. As a nation, we are not moving ahead. Our kids are not learning more. And here we are in international comparisons. Uh, Kathy got a laugh out of Latvia. So the countries that are ahead of us in education of their kids, the Slovak Republic, Estonia, Slovenia. So we're getting clean in international competition. Now at the top, we're doing pretty well. But on average, we are not educating our kids as well as we could, and we're not getting the returns that we would get suggested by that uh, four-year college data that I showed you a minute ago. Now, the thing that is really interesting to me, at least, is that here are investments we could make. I don't have time to talk about all these, but I think the PowerPoint will be available so you can look at these and think about them in, uh, on your own time. I, I would like to mention a few things. I think of all the things that we do, the thing that has the greatest potential for helping poor kids is preschool. Kathy showed the data from the Perry Preschool. We have similar data from the Abstadarian Project. We have similar data, not quite as impressive because it, we haven't followed the kids that long yet, uh, but we have good data from state pre-K programs uh, that there really is a big impact on average for high quality preschool. And I want to emphasize, could not emphasize this more. I don't know how many politicians I've heard over the years say, if they all had preschool, everything would be fine. Well, that's not true. Because Head Start, for example, is 
fairly good preschool, but on average it doesn't have much of an impact. We know that now from a national random assignment study. Some of those Head Start centers are great, and they would, I'll bet you some of those kids are going to look like the kids from Perry Preschool. But on average, and that's what we're talking about here, we want the nation to move, everybody to have a chance, not just a select group. And yet we have lots of lousy Head Start programs. This administration has done more, a Democratic administration to reform Head Start. In fact, I would say they blasted it apart. And a lot of Head Start programs lost their money competitively because they weren't doing a good job. That's what we needed to do. And I think in five years, if we do a national random assignment study for Head Start, that will really show that it's a better program. So it's hard to do good preschool. But if we could learn to do it, and all our poor kids, and even kids above the poverty line, got high quality preschool, it would make a big, big difference. And let me point out something here that is not, I used to never even say this because people sometimes get upset. But think of the logic of Head Start all the way back in 1965 when the program started. The logic was that these kids are not getting in their homes what they need to do well in the public schools and to grow up and to be well employed. It starts early in the preschool years. That was the insight. And we have to take these kids to a special center to make sure that they get the experiences that they need to be prepared to enter the public schools and learn like other kids do. And that's the same logic today. It's because kids do not get in their homes what they need. I think Kathy's descriptions of some of these households are amazing and they give you an idea of the obstacles, the barriers that these kids face. Uh, some of these kids come from chaos. And it's hard to learn well when you come from chaos. And it's especially hard to learn good social skills, which are, we now know are extremely important in public education. So preschool is extremely important. Um, I want to mention, again, the uh, career academies that Kathy mentioned. She left out one thing that I think is really crucial, and that is part of the intervention was that the kids got an experience in the workplace continuously. Not that they necessarily had a job, some of them did, but they, would, they went to work, they had a mentor there, would tell them about, and they learned really complicated things like, boy, you've got to be on time. You have to get along with your coworkers. You have to learn to take directions from a boss. That's especially hard for some boys. And those kids, eight years after they graduated from high school, eight years, we have very few data sets with this kind of follow-up information. They were making more money, they were more likely to have jobs, and guess what? They were 16, almost 20% more likely to live with their kids because they were more likely to be married or at least to live with the mother of their children. So it even had an impact on family stability. So those are good examples of the things that we could do. I want to mention one more thing, but I can't see the clock. Oh, 10 on 6, there it is. Okay, so I have another hour and a half. Uh, I just want to mention one more thing, and that is employment and training. You would think that people who have a good attitude and want to work, that we would be able to develop programs to put them in these programs, and they would get skills, and here's something we've learned, that are needed in the local economy, and that they would be able to move up and they'd be good employees. I was in Wisconsin last year, uh, and there was, I was on a panel with a bunch of employers, and they went on and on about how they need welders. And they could not find welders. One guy who owns a, a fairly small company said, I could increase my business by at least a third if I could find good welders, but we just can't find them. And this is a story all over the United States. There, I've seen various estimates, more than a million jobs, two million jobs, that are vacant because there aren't skilled people to take them in. You would think that we would be able to develop the programs to do that, working with employers and so forth. There are a few examples that we've been able to do it, but on the whole, our employment and training programs are a bust. And this is a shame because we have a lot of kids who are never going to go to college. They're not smart enough to graduate from college, and they could wind up with a big debt, and that would set them back rather than help them move ahead. So there, we have kids that are not destined for college, but they could still have good jobs in our economy if they can get the skills that they need, and we need to develop those programs. The administration, again, is doing a lot, uh, but so far, I can't, I can't say that we've had great success. So now, path two, family composition. And Kathy and I have both talked about this several times. Here are the marriage rates by age. You know what you call this? You call this a social revolution. This is a social revolution. At every age, marriage rates are declining. And way, way fewer people at any given age are married than in the past. And 
I assure you that the people in this audience who are in their early 20s, I believe, many of you, uh, will follow that same pattern. My own kids have followed that pattern. It's a huge cultural change.